Hallelujah, hallelujah. You're welcome. Uh, this will be the second session. Uh, we did a prayer in the first session for America. Now we're going to go into um, the, the closing session for a subject we started last week. We titled it, Whose Image is Inscribed Upon Your Soul? And this will be part two. Whose Image is Inscribed Upon Your Soul? And this is part two. <clears throat> So last week we saw from scripture that the soul can be written upon. The Lord God, who is the maker of the soul, showed us that this is possible. It is possible to write upon the soul. Who would know but the one who made the soul, right? And we see first and foremost, even through the wisdom of Solomon, and don't forget the wisdom of Solomon was inspired by the Lord God. So this is not human wisdom. This is the wisdom that the Lord you know, gave this man. So through that wisdom, the Lord gave a word through Solomon in Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 3. Solomon was speaking actually to his own uh, 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 son. A lot of people believe it was uh, Jeroboam, you know. But anyway, let's just proceed. So Proverbs 7, 3, my son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. <clears throat> Keep my commands and leave, and my law as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. So you can see here that specific instructions were given, and this man is showing how to make these words stick. He said, my son, keep my words and treasure my commands. But how do you do that? By binding them to your fingers, one, but also write them on the tablet of your heart. Some people will immediately say, oh, that's just been poetic. Okay, fine. But then the Lord himself now speaks. The Lord himself now spoke through the mouth of a prophet. So it's no longer a poet or a, po or a poem. It's coming from a prophetic person now who is prophesying, declaring it prophetically declaring prophetically and this is talking about decades that separated these two persons solomon and here jeremiah so in jeremiah 31 and verse 33 he said but this is the covenant that i will make with the house of israel this is the lord prophesying it wasn't just jeremiah making a poem or being poetic it was declaring thus says the lord this is the covenant that i will make with the house of israel after those days in days to come uh, based on the time frame says the Lord. So Jeremiah is very clear. This is the Lord speaking. And the Lord says, I will put my law in their minds. Think about this. And write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. So there's a correlation between the writing of the Lord's laws upon the, by the way, when it says heart, it's talking about soul. Because we know the heart is a biological organ that you know pumps blood people say it's a valve okay pumps blood but the soul is what we know it all started with if you go back to the book of genesis the lord got breathed into that thing and it became a living soul so living souls we're dealing with living souls we're dealing with living souls but again those words are interchangeable but there's a correlation here it seems between the writing of the lord's laws on the hearts or souls of his people and him claiming them to be his belonging. Think about this because we're going to come to it towards the end. So the Lord says, I claim you to be mine because my laws are written on your heart. I will write my laws in your heart. I will write my laws upon your soul. And that way, I know you belong to me. Oh, think about that child of God. So the writing of the law of God, that writing of the word of God upon the soul, upon the heart of his people is what tells him they belong to him, is how they know they belong to him. So they shall be my people and I will be their God. Isn't that interesting? So how does the Lord actually write upon our hearts? You're going to find in another text, it's called, actually when you do a study of heart, it means inward parts, which is the soul. And you're going to see one of the texts we read actually mentions soul. So how does the Lord write upon our souls? Well, we're going to find out that the divine instructions he gave actually shows how he does that. 
But first, we know that the end goal, what God is trying to accomplish is to have his word, his laws written upon the souls, upon the heart of his people. That's the end goal. That is the end goal. That is what he wants to accomplish. So because when he accomplishes that, then the, the, he can claim it. He can now say they belong to him. That is how he knows they belong to him. So those who belong to him, he writes his words upon them. So again, child of God. So you see, just saying, I'm a Christian. I, 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 we are remnants. We're body of Christ. I, I go to church. It's not what cuts it. Do you really belong to God? And how do you know you belong to the Lord? He has written his laws on your heart, upon your soul. And how do we know when he's written his laws upon your soul? They become your operating system. <laughs> his word upon your soul becomes the operating system of your life. That is how it is, child of God. Just going to church is not it. Just serving in church is not it. Just doing religious lingo and cliches is not enough. But has the laws of the Lord been written upon your soul? That's why this message is critical. Because when the law of the Lord is not yet written upon your soul, then you do not belong to him yet. You do not belong to him. Uh, Romans 8 will tell us, if any man does not have the spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. Do you have the spirit of Christ in you? Because if you don't, child of God, <laughs> you're child of God by virtue of creation, but you're not child of God by virtue of sonship. So we can be children of God by virtue of creation. Everybody qualifies for that. But we want to be children of God by virtue of sonship, by virtue of, of him being our father, family tie, if you will. All right. So how does the Lord do it? First and foremost, again, we said the end goal is to write his laws, write his word upon our souls, upon the tablets of our hearts. He, he himself said that's what he wants to accomplish. So the question is, how does he do it? Well, we're going to find out that he accomplished that through the divine instructions he gave to Israel regarding how to interact with his word. Don't forget, the word is his word, right? And he's trying to communicate with these human beings. Guys, there's something about my word I want you to know. My word is powerful. My word is transformative. My word is creative. Don't you see, by my word, I created the heavens. There's something about the word of God, people of God. It's the word of God is powerful. The word of God, uh, uh, when you go to Psalm 29, the word of God is majestic. The voice of the Lord, the sound of the Lord, it splinters the cedars. It causes birth. It, it, it lays bare the, 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 the deserts of, of Kadesh, the wilderness of Kadesh. And then all of his people shout glory in the temple. There is something about his word. By his spoken word, he called all things to be. He wants his children to understand the power in his word. Jesus Christ said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We just don't know what the word of God is. We don't. And because we don't know what the word of God is, we devalue it. We don't take it seriously. We treat it with levity. We even abuse it in some cases. But the Lord is trying to get us to understand. The Lord, our Father, is trying to get us to understand my word, my word is precious. There's something about my word. I want you to have it written in your soul. Or allow me to write my words, my laws in your soul. For when I do, I mean, there are tremendous promises. Tremendous promises. Long life, prosperity. You will not see evil days. I, wish, I mean, so many promises he made. If that is done, that is the way to go, child of God. You who love God, who you say you serve God, that is the way to go. Worship leaders, make your worship the word of God. Praying people, make your prayers the word of God. Talking people, talk the word of God. Converse the word of God. How does God write it? We're going to see from the instructions he gave Israel. How to, in, it says Israel, here is how to interact with my word. I want to teach you how to interact with my word. But from those instructions, we find out that that is how the word becomes inscribed upon the tablets or, the ta or you know, upon our souls, the tables of our, tablets of our hearts or upon our souls. So the divine instructions that God gave to Israel regarding how to interact with his laws, 
revealed how to write or inscribe the word of the Lord upon their hearts and upon their souls. He gave them instructions on what certain things to do. And those things are how you write the word or how he writes his word upon our souls. But we're also going to see that those instructions or those revelations he gave also show us the data types, the data types that are readily compatible with and absorbable by the human soul. So like we said last week, the human soul is like a sponge that soaks up any liquid. The human soul is an open, writable and readable storage device. It's open. It's not, it's not locked. There's no secret code to it. It's just there because you have your access points, your access points being your ear, your eyes, and all of that, and your mind, and so on and so forth. These are access points. These are gateways. These are portals into your soul. It's open. Nobody works with the ears shut. Nobody works with the eyes closed. All right? So these data types are able to infiltrate. In fact, you will have to put in extra work to push out or reject certain data types. And we have to do that. In the days to come, in fact, now is uh, those days, we need to do that more. So we're also going to see the data types that are readily absorbable by the human soul. Data types that are readable by the soul. Data types that the soul can soak in like a sponge and store in storage places, in layers of the soul. The soul is in layers, comes in multiple layers. Only God knows. Certain things can be buried, stored in the soul, and you just don't know they are there. And these data types have, way, have ways of accessing the human soul. We have to watch these things. The first one we see is in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 10. It says, through Moses, gather the people to me, and I will let them hear my words. So we talk about hearing the word of God. So the first data type is that of audio. So audio is the first data type that is revealed to us. So sound is compatible to the soul. The soul can be written upon through sound. That's why the Bible says this book of the law must not depart out of your mouth. Why? It didn't say out of your ear but, or out of your heart or out of your book or out of your paper, out of your mouth. It has to be, it has to be given audio. It has to be vocalized. It has to be put in a sound, in the form of sound. Sound so that your ear receives it. Sound so that your ear receives it. Audio is the first data type. So sound, and don't forget, I'm not going to go into the details, but we've already talked about sound being vibration. So vibration, I mean, you can't even, the vibration is that's another world altogether because by, through vibration, I believe all things were created. I believe through the power of vibration, all things were created. So vibration, definitely, the soul has, you know, a connection or vibration can reach the soul. The vibration can write upon the soul. The question is, whose vibration are you receiving? Whose vibration is ministering to you? But sound can. And you know, the enemy knows that I'm going to come to that, you know, touch it briefly. That's why he's producing sounds that can really touch the soul. And experiments have been done on these things. I'm not just talking talk. Experiments have been done on it. There were a lot of musicians who understand certain chords to strike on your guitar. They know chords to strike, you know, on your acoustic, especially. Oh my God, they know how to strike those chords and it does something to the head. It will just get you up your, your seat. You want to dance, you feel like dancing because it does something to the soul. They even know the coordinates, the co you know, the, 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 let's not go to all that. But sound, sound is compatible to the soul. Sound can be used to write upon the soul. So certain sounds resonate to the soul. Certain sounds are absorbable by the soul. That's why it doesn't matter if you're anointed or not. When certain sounds begin to play, you just, you begin to see your head nod before you whistle, wait a minute, I, should, I shouldn't be nodding to that. That, come on, I bind you, devil, get out but your soul naturally drifts towards those sounds. There are melodious sounds that just appeals to your soul. It just pulls your soul in a certain way. Oh, for some, it even gives you goosebumps and stuff. Sound. And the Lord himself is teaching this, teaching his people this. 
So can we find out ways to use sound to write the word of God in our soul? Scripture memory songs. Scripture memory songs. Think about it. That's what Paul said. He said, he said, you know, singing unto yourself spiritual songs, you know, hymns, making melody in your heart. Spiritual songs, but spiritual songs, which are scriptural. Based, that's why you as a worship leader, don't just go with melody. Don't just go with feeling. Don't just go with stuff. Go with the word of God. Because as you do that, not only are you ministering, but you're also producing a mighty harvest for the kingdom of God. So we have a text, Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 to 8. It says, and these words, which I command you today, shall be in your hearts. Don't forget that is soul. So God wants his words to be in our soul. Seven, you shall teach them diligently to your children. These are specific instructions that we have to obey. These are specific instructions if we want to see the word of the Lord written upon the souls of our children. Look at the sort of children that we're raising today. And looking at the indoctrination going on, child of God, you've got to wake up. You have got to wake up. You cannot just go to sleep and let the world indoctrinate your children for you. And then you give birth to children who are supposed to be, the Bible said they shall surround you like olive branches. They shall speak with the enemy at the gate. But you relinquish them to the enemy and the enemy turn them to soldiers of hell who will come back and torment your soul for the few years they will be with you before they now go out to do Satan's bidding. God forbid. At an early age, begin to impart your children. Begin to follow the word of God. This is how we combat the spirit of the age. The Lord has given us the antidote. He's given us the technology to battle the spirits of today's age. Spirit of the world today that is coming aggressively against all that we know was truth before. We've got to combat them. Bring your children at the end of, send them to school. Let them come back. But do what the word of the Lord says. Teach your children. Teach them diligently. Don't just leave them in the hands of the teachers or the school systems. Teach them yourself diligently. Teach them the word of the Lord. Or look at the next thing. Say, talk of the word when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. These are strategic postures of the soul. Strategic postures of the soul. Think about it. It's a strategy the Lord has given us here. The one who is the maker of the soul, the one who understands the dynamics of the soul, is teaching us how to open up the soul to receive his instructions. When you sit, so when you sit, your soul assumes a relaxed position. No work, no pressure, nothing, just relax. It says, talk the word then. Talk the word. Talk about the word of God. So in other words, there is something about hearing the word of God at a relaxed state. That's the first step. Oh, it so said when you walk. So at this moment, when you're walking, your soul is active. Your soul is observant. Your soul is observing things. Don't forget, your eyes are gateways. Your ears are gateways. Your feeling is gateways. So your, those are interacting with your soul. And it says, talk the word. Talk the word. So you talk the word when your soul is relaxed. You talk the word when your soul is active, when your soul is busy interacting with the environment. Why? So as to counter strange sounds, counter strange frequencies, counter strange signals. So rather than your soul receiving strange signals happening all around, you're using the word. The word is coming in. Oh, my goodness. And if you do that constantly, your soul will now begin to become addicted to the word. But then it goes on when you lie down. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. When I saw this, I said, Lord, you are, you are the all-wise God. When you lie down, in other words, your soul is drifting, getting ready to go to rest, getting ready to go to sleep. Let your soul let the last thing your soul hears before it, before it takes a nap, let the last thing your soul hears be the word of God. So as he's drifting away into sleep, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, before he goes to sleep. But then he says, when you wake up in the morning, the first thing, <laughs> when I saw this, I said, my Lord and my God, you are a strategist. You are a strategist. So when you wake up, the first thing your soul should hear, the word of the Lord, talk it. Talk it. That's what it says. Talk about the word. When you sit, when you walk, when you lie down, when you rise up. 
These are different postures of the soul, divine strategy to write the word in our souls. The second thing, I, I mean, there are much there, I'm not, not going to spend all the time on it, but the second thing we see is, is found in Deuteronomy 11 and verse 18. Deuteronomy 11 and verse 18. It says, therefore, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart, again, soul, and in your soul. You see that? So it specifically mentions there, there, in your soul. So just before you say, is, it, is that what scripture says? Well, it says, is that right there? In your soul. In your soul. I don't know how you do it in the biological uh, organ called the heart, but heart and soul are interchangeable. But to be more exact, is the soul. The soul is the conscious man. The soul is the seat of your consciousness. The soul is, in fact, what the Bible tells us was created. He breathed into that thing, it became a living soul. So your soul is living, your soul is conscious. So these are to write your words, his words in your soul. Bind them as a sign on your hand, okay? And as frontless between your eyes, okay? So we're talking visual now. Bind them as sign. So this time we're not talking about sound. We're not talking about audio. We're talking about sight. We're talking about visual. So the data type is visual. If I bind it as a sign in my, on my on my hand, it means I'm looking at it. I can see it. If I bind it as frontlets between my eyes, now I, how <laughs> how close can it get? <laughs> Which means you're carrying it everywhere you go. Oh my Lord, oh my God! God is so serious about this matter. And since of God, this is to let us. This is the only way to go about it. Look at Jesus Christ on the Mount of Temptation. It is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. That's how you defeat the devil. It is written. We've got to get back to that child of God. It is written. Do you know what has been written? What is written? You got to teach your children, surround your home with the word. It is written. That's how, that's the only thing the devil doesn't know what to do with. He will want you to celebrate, dance, do everything else. But the word of God, nah. Because mm -mm. he knows Man lives by the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is transformative. Bind it as frontlets between your eyes, which means as you're walking around, you're carrying it in all over the place. You're seeing it all the time. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So sight is also compatible to the soul. What the soul sees, don't forget your eyes, the gateway. What the soul sees, it can immediately embrace. It can, it can, it can absorb. And so if somebody wanted to program, I mean, we know pro, we, we have a lot of programs to do, and that's why they call programs because they are designed to do something. And you see how the enemy has hijacked this portion and can flash our, our eyes with all sorts of imageries. And then those imageries are stuck in our souls. That like it will take you days and weeks of prayer and, 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 and reprogramming and deprogramming to get it off your system. But the soul can be written upon through visuals. What are you gazing your eyes on? A particular scripture says, my, my eyes will not be, you know, my, my eyes will not behold something that is abominable. We got to watch that because these are gateways to the soul. So we have a scripture for that again. Deuteronomy 11, verse 19 and 20. You shall teach the word to your children. Again, it repeats the same thing. Speaking of the word, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down by the word of by the mouth of two or three witnesses, this is the second time he's saying that. When you rise up, but then he now adds verse 20, you shall write the word on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Look at that strategy. He wants you to write the word, write his laws, write you know, his word, whatever word that ministers to you. In their case, it was the commandments. He said, write it on your doorpost and write it on the gates. So what is that as you're going out and as you're coming in? Because when you're going out, you're going to go through the gates. You see that word. You see the laws. It registers in your mind. It registers in your soul. You remember it. Then when you're coming in, you see it on your doorpost before you walk into the house. It registers in your mind. You see it again. So in other words, put it all around the house. Put it all around you where you can see it where you can see it. Interesting, interesting. 
The third one he showed, we see in the word, is in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 9 to 14. He said, for the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law. And if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, for this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. Because some people were beginning to complain this is too much. God says, no, it's not. It's not too mysterious. It's not burdensome. It's not burdensome. It's not like in heaven. I'm asking you to come fetch it from heaven. So you're not going to say who will ascend to heaven to bring it down to us so that we can hear it and do it. No. Nor is it beyond the sea. That you should say, oh, who will go over to the sea for us to bring it to us? No. It says no. But the word is very near you. Watch this. In your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. So it says, don't just say it. Don't just see it. Do it. Now, here is where I'm going with this. The Lord was say, seems to be saying to the children of Israel, Make up your mind to do it. Okay. Decide to do it. So the data type here is decisive action. <laughs> decisive action. A decided posture to do the word of God. When you come to a decision as, okay, I'm going to do the word of God. I choose to do the word of God. It's a choice. Because some people quote it. Some people read it. Some people memorize it and do all of that stuff even preach it to other people, but don't do it. That's why, you know, James will say, those who are not doers are deceiving themselves. Okay, they're deceiving themselves because they're not doers of the word. Whosoever looketh into this perfect law of liberty, he himself not being just a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, that's the one who is blessed. All right? So a decisive action, a decisive choice a decisive posture to do the word to obey the word so action is readable to the soul your soul observes your actions actions that you repeat repetitive actions become ingrained in your soul that's why you're told whatever you do for 21 days straight you know you continue to do it for 21 days straight becomes a part of you your soul absorbs it so, okay this is who we are this is the direction we are going so that's why you have addictions, and I'm going to come to that because that's what the devil does. So the devil introduces addictions because through addictions, the soul is bound. So people can be addicted to smoking. People can be addicted to, to drinking, you know, liquor and, and alcoholic drinks. People can be addicted to, to immoral, you know, uh, uh, acts and relationships. People can even be addicted to crime. Addiction. Why? It's not the addiction that is the thing, it's the repetitive or repetitive exercise, repetitive action. The fact that you're going back to it, the fact that you're doing it again, the fact that you're doing it again, the fact that you're doing it again, it has become registered in your soul. So the Lord said, use the same, well, it was the Lord who actually brought it up first. The enemy is just perverting it. So the Lord introduced this dimension, take a decisive action to do the word. Take a decisive action the next day to do it. Choose to do it, choose to do it. Choose to do it until it becomes your norm. It becomes what your soul delights in. The soul delights in doing the work because of repetitive exercise, repetitive action. So the soul can be written upon through repetitive action. What you do continually becomes inscribed upon your soul. Your soul takes it as the way to go, takes it as the course, takes it as the path to walk. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14 in the Names of God version says, solid food is for the mature, for those whose faculties have been trained. So you can actually train your faculties. Those whose faculties have been trained by continuous exercise to distinguish good from evil. So a continuous exercise trains the faculties. By continuous exercise, write that down, by continuous exercise, we train the faculties. If you can train your muscles by continuous exercise, train your mind, continuous exercise, train your body, continuous exercise, you can also train your soul by continuous exercise. So the question then is, what exercise do you train your soul with? The faculties of the soul can be trained 
by continuous exercise of the word, continuous doing of the word, decisive action, decisive decision, decisive choice to do the word all the time. Do it again, do it again, do it again. Your soul now registers, okay, we're people of the word. We do the word. That's what your soul will say. Now, Satan has learned the art, definitely, that we already know. Satan understands that the human soul can be inscribed upon. He knows it. He's a spirit. So he uses the same data types, audio, sound, visuals, sights, and addictions. So in the case of repetitive actions or repetitive exercise, it makes it an addiction. So you are addicted to something and you find that you can't get away from it because your soul, that's what you talk about, soul tie. Your soul is tied to it. Your soul has become tied. Your soul has become meat to that thing or to that person if it's, a, if it's a case where a person is involved. And so by that, he captivates the souls of people. So you whose soul is bound by addictions, understand what's going on here. The enemy is just going for your soul. So don't be making excuses for it. You got to fight that and I receive strength to get out of it. You can break from every negative addiction by the power of the spirit. Just begin to do the opposite. It's going to take a while. The same way you got into it is the same way you're going to get out of it. You did it and did it and did it and did it again and again and again until it became an addiction. Stop doing it. You're going to fight. It's going to press you. It's going to shake you. It's going to push you. Your body's going to feel like you're going to die. No, you ain't going to die. Just Stay with your position, stay with your decision. And then, of course, there are other things you can do to help. You know, you know, some people would replace the, that's what we call the principle of replacement. So for smokers, for instance, replace with gum, replace with something else that is you know healthy and stuff like that, and so on and so forth. So Satan predicates this, he's able to inscribe upon the souls using the same data types, but he operates this through a pre-existing law, a principle that is already in existence. And we talked about this in a previous message. So one of the principles that the devil operates that gives him the right of way, that gives him the legal ground to be able to inscribe upon the souls of people and it stays. And in fact, God honors it, is found in Mark 12, 16 to 17. This is the Lord Jesus. It's talking about, you know, they came asking him, oh, should we give taxes or should we not? He says, why are you tempting me? Let me see the, 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 the currency, the money at the time. And they gave him that. And then he looked at it and he asked them, whose image? He asked them in verse 16, whose image and inscription is this on the coin? And they said to him, it is Caesar's image. It is Caesar's inscription. And Jesus said, okay, render or give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God, the things that are God's. Now, please take note. If you want to make a, a stronger, if you want to make a detailed argument, you would say, well, uh, the coin was created by God <laughs> because the coin was manufactured from, from bronze or manufactured from gold or manufactured from silver and gold and silver belongs to the Lord. You could make that argument. But Jesus didn't go that route. He's teaching us something here. Even though humans were made by God, humans belong to the Lord. But just because the inscription that is on it is not a godly inscription, it's not a God inscription, it's, it belongs to the other person. It's gold belongs to him. Silver belongs to him. Gold and silver were used to make these coins. He didn't claim that. He said, well, God owns all the whole thing. God owns everything on this. What are you guys talking about? God owns everything. He said, no, whose inscription is on the coin? They say it's Caesar. I give it to Caesar. So in other words, look for the things that have the inscription of, of God on them. They belong to the Lord, which is why going back again, God said, I will write my words on your soul. Then you belong to me. So whose inscription is upon your soul, child of God? Whose inscription is upon your soul? Whose image and inscription is upon our souls? That is who we belong to. That is who we belong to. And we now see the ways it happens. Whose sounds, whose vibrations we are, we are dancing to, whose sights entice our soul, whose actions we gravitate towards. When we, the Bible says, he who continues to sin is not of God. See that? He who continues to sin, who abides in sin is not of God. For the seed of God will not allow you to do that. Will not allow you to do that. 
So if one continues to sin and say, I'm of God, I'm of God, but you, your repetitive action, your repetitive exercise is against God, is anti-God, is more in the nature of the devil. Oh, child of God, your soul belongs to you. If you're a child of God, your soul belongs to the other guy now. You've got to wrest your soul away from the hand of the devil. The second principle the devil uses is the principle of joining to whom the soul is joined. So the first one is whose inscription is on the soul. Whose inscription on, on, is on the soul is who the soul belongs to. Whom the soul chooses to join to is whom the soul belongs to. First Corinthians 6, 15 to 17. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a hallow? Stop there and listen to what Paul is saying. This is critical. Paul says, shall I then take the members of Christ? So he acknowledges they are members of Christ. And speaking of your body parts, members of your body, members of Christ, they belong to Christ, but I can make them, see that? I can make them members of to a harlot, members of a harlot. So which means there's a transformation. It's possible to take the members of Christ, which is in this case, talking about members of your body, but it's a broad principle. So members of Christ can become members of a harlot. Why? By an action a soul choosing to join itself to. So if a soul chooses to join to demonic spirits, if a soul chooses to join to satanic agenda, if a soul chooses to join to the world, guess what? That soul now automatically belongs to that one that he has joined to, to whom you yield your servants, to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, to that one you become a servant or a slave. For two, he says, shall become one flesh. So Paul says, this is possible because of the principle of joining. Two becomes one flesh. But also by the same principle, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So it's a matter of choice. Who do I join to? That's why we have to deliberately say, Lord, my soul belongs to you. I give you my soul. I yield my soul to you, Lord. Lord Jesus, my soul, in my consciousness, now that I'm conscious, I know what I'm talking about. It's my choice. I choose you, Jesus. You got to do that. But your actions also have to marry or align with your uh, confession. The next principle that the enemy uses to make that happen is who your soul worships. <laughs> the principle of worship. Who does your soul worship? Who does your soul worship? You know, when you sing the praises of, of a thing, you're literally worshiping that thing. When your soul adores something, you're, you're literally worshiping that thing. We don't, we don't know this, but it's true. Your soul, when your soul adores something, when your soul is, oh my God, when that it, it, like it elates your soul, whatever it is that elates your soul, you're literally worshiping that thing. Revelation 14, verse 9 to 12, the, this third angel declared, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships, please ob observe. Again, you got to pay attention to the words. If anyone, anyone, oh, I'm an anointed man of God. If anyone, oh, I'm a worship leader in church. If anyone, I gave my life to Jesus 50 years ago. If anyone worships the beast. So the question we got to ask ourselves is, am I in any way worshiping the beast? <laughs> ah, yeah, 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 yeah. That's why you got to be careful. And this is why it's critical when you see church folks who are aligning themselves with certain agenda, it makes you wonder, are you sure you want to do that? Are you sure that's where you belong? Are you sure you want to be defending that? Are you sure you want to even be conversing for that? Why don't you just leave it alone? If anyone worships the beast and his image and then receives his mark, we've already talked about digitized versions of the mark. So even the angels acknowledge if you receive the mark. He said, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't receive the name of the beast. I didn't, I did, I, it's just the mark. He said, well, the mark is the same. If anyone receives the mark or his mark on their forehead or on their hand. So there's something about this mark. The mark is considered as grievous as the raw thing, as the original thing. If anyone does that, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So in other words, you no longer belong to God because now you've, 
you've taken their side. So the wrath of God that was meant for the devil and his demons, you also take part in it. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. May the Lord help us. May that not be our portion in Jesus' name. But it continues, verse 11. Whose name the soul bears. So it's possible for the soul to bear the name of. The Lord God told Moses, he said, this is how you will bless the children of Israel. And in so doing, you will put my name upon them. You put my name upon them. So it's possible to put the name of the Lord upon his people, the seal of God. It's also possible to put the name of the devil upon people. Hi. People get this. Please get this. It's possible for the devil to put his name. Again, it's about inscribing upon the soul. The angel continued, verse 11, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever received the mark of his name. So you don't know the mark. We don't know what the mark is going to look like, but we now know from this scripture that mark is the mark of his name. Whatever it turns out to be. And that's why you can't take it. You can't, you can't play games with these things. And so the, the devil is doing test runs right now, introducing little marks. And people are just receiving it like crazy, including ministers. You're just taking marks. You don't even know what you're doing. But these are test runs. Well, that mark, when it eventually shows up, will be a mark of his name. So the enemy is also, the devil and his children are also doing their lab work. They are doing their research to see how to tie a mark to the name of the devil, to see how to digitize his name into a mark. And the Lord help us. But, it, but look at verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. So it's, there's something about keeping the commandments of God. There's something about allowing the commandments of God to be written upon your soul. The angel says, this is the patient. This is why you've been doing that. So the writing of the word of the Lord upon your soul is to keep you from this. The writing, the keeping of the commandments, not just the keeping of doing it, but the keeping of it in your heart, in your soul. This is the patient. This is why we're telling you to do that. This is why we're telling you to do that. So the faith of Jesus that you held on to, your patience, your suffering, everything, this is why. Because you don't get to, you know, partake in the wrath of God with the devil and his demons. So saints of God, we must guard our souls. We must guard our souls. This is a fight, is a war. We must guard our souls. So I repeat what I said last week. The composition of the human soul is such that it is like a sponge, an open storage device that soaks up and receives any data type that is compatible, that is written on it. So the human soul is readable, writable, open storage device. It receives any compatible data and we've seen some, uh, the human soul is an open, readable, writable storage device that receives any compatible data that comes its way. If it's a compatible data, in fact, you will have to consciously push certain data out. Say, no, I don't want to hear that. Switch the TV off. Turn off that music. I don't want to hear it. Because if you don't, it will filter in. You don't have control over it. There's no gate. There's no door to close your ears. Okay, shut the door. shut the door of my ears. So you know your ears are open. Your eyes are open. Your mind is processing. You don't have control over it. You will have to consciously walk away. Consciously wind up your glass. Consciously stop that program. Consciously change channel. Consciously move away from the place. Well, here we have scriptures. Philippians four eight. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, see another strategy. Whatever things are true. Whatever things are true, child of God. Do you care about truth? Do you care about truth, child of God? You just want to go with political agenda because you love your political party. Do you care about truth? Whatsoever things are true. That's the first thing you want to find out. Is this true? Is this true? Or is it made up? Is somebody just trying to deceive us? I know it sounds palatable. I know it sounds appealing. The guy is a master, you know, wordsmith. But is it true? Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just. Is it just, child of God? Does it bear the signal or the signature of justice? The justice of God, not the justice of man. Whatever things are pure, is this pure? You see nasty things happening in the world. Is it pure? 
Do you see purity in that, child of God? Is there purity in that? Whatever things are lovely, does it bear the signature of love? And we're talking about love, agape, true love, pure love. Is there good report? Does it bear good report? Is it, is it virtuous? Is it praiseworthy? Is it something I can come out and be praising? Oh, thank you, Lord, for this thing. Hallelujah. Glory to you. Can you do it for that thing? Can you do it for that thing you are endorsing? Can you do it for that thing you are accepting? Can you come and so, say, Lord, we thank you for that. I'm, begin, I'm just beginning to praise God for that. That's the measure. That's the standard. That's how to measure things. It says when you find those things, meditate on those things. Meditate on these things. Meditate on these things. And finally, Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all things. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. What is inscribed on the soul will determine how your soul goes, will determine how your life goes. It works on this planet, but it also works in the afterlife. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Lord, we give you praise. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray, oh God, that you will help us. <clears throat> Help us, help us, Lord, cause your word to be engrafted on the tablets of our souls. Yes, Lord, we yield our soul to you. Write your laws. Write your word. Holy Spirit, you are the pen, the pen in the hand of Yahweh. Oh, Holy Spirit, inscribe the laws of God. Inscribe the word of God upon the tables of our hearts, upon our souls, that we may know it, that we may do it that we may be those who live in accordance with the word of God, that we may be those whose operating system is the word of the Lord, the living word of God. Holy Spirit, teach us the word. Begin to teach us also how to use the word as a battle weapon, as a weapon of warfare, because the Bible calls it the sword of the spirit, the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith will, will deflect the, the fiery darts of the wicked one, the sword of the spirit. We judge, dissect, divide, heather and theater. Oh, Holy Spirit, teach us. Let us become like the word bride in the book of Revelation, soaked totally from head to toe in the word of God, immersed, submerged in the word of God. For man lives not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Lord, may we live by the word, the proceeding word from your mouth. And Lord, we pray for those who are addicted in one way or another. The Lord, the power for freedom, the power of salvation, the power that brings deliverance will come upon them. That as they receive and as they embrace your truth, that the power of addiction be broken out of their life. In the name of Jesus Christ. The Lord is replaced with the Spirit of God. It is replaced with positive actions. It is, it is replaced with, with positive, repetitive exercise that is wholesome, that is healthy, that causes positive transformation, that causes spiritual growth, that brings health in the name of Jesus. We give you thanks, Lord. We give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen until we come your way again shortly. You stay elevated. Love you. God bless you. Bye-bye now.